Hello, hello, everyone. We are so excited to have you all here for the New York EdTech and Future of Privacy Forum virtual event. We're going to begin by introducing our hosts. We'll then transition into today's exciting lineup of topics, including FERPA, COPA, and security, the role of contracts and buyers, AI, the student privacy pledge, and two opportunities for Q&As. To begin, I'll introduce myself. I'm Alexandra. I am currently a product designer and learning specialist with over 10 years of experience in education here in New York City and abroad. I help manage the New York EdTech Slack community, including our virtual events. Now, if you're interested in joining the New York EdTech Slack community, we're going to drop the invite link in the chat. Um, also, feel free to share your LinkedIn profiles in the chat throughout today's event. We're now going to turn it over to Daniel to hear more about today's exciting agenda. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel Hales, and I am a policy fellow on the Youth and Education team here at the Future of Privacy Forum. Just as a quick note for those of you who are not already familiar, FPF is a global nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing privacy leadership, scholarship, and principled data practices in support of emerging technologies. FPF is focused on advancing responsible data practices and has deep expertise regarding privacy and data protection, including for the purposes of this boot camp, issues affecting students, parents, teachers, education technology vendors, and others with a stake in protecting student data. Before I turn it over to Alexa to kick us off with uh, her presentation on FERPA, I do want to note for the audience that uh, these first two presentations that we will have on our agenda on FERPA and then on COPPA and security will have a Q&A segment that will be held in block at the end of the COPPA and security presentation. So as these presentations are going on, please feel free to drop your questions in the chat and we will circle back around to them during the Q&A portion. Uh, without further delay, I'll now turn it over to Alexa Mooney. Hello, everyone. Let me share my screen here. All right. So as I said, my name is Alexa Mooney. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Great. Okay. Um, I am going to be sharing some information um, about FERPA. This is the uh, Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. Many of you may be familiar with FERPA, and so you may know that FERPA applies to schools. Specifically, it applies to educational institutions that receive federal funding. So that could include elementary schools, secondary schools, post-secondary institutions, and so on. It actually does not apply to companies. And there's some really common confusion around this. When I am reviewing ed tech company privacy policies, I often see a vendor describe their product as FERPA compliant. Um, this is problematic language because a vendor cannot be FERPA compliant since FERPA does not apply to vendors. Schools cannot outsource their responsibilities under FERPA. So now you might be wondering if FERPA doesn't apply to us, why are we even talking about it? While FERPA applies to schools and as you are working with schools, EdTech products need to be able to be used in a FERPA compliant way. So as we go through the presentation, pay attention to what is required of schools by FERPA and be thinking about if and how your product can support the school in meeting those requirements. Furthermore, later you're going to hear about something called the school official exception to FERPA. And this is likely one that will apply to most vendors. So sp pay special attention to that, as well as another exception as well. There are a number um, 
of exceptions to FERPA, but we just that we are going to talk about, we just wanted to um, do some of the key highlights first. So FERPA is really about fairness. Um, it's meant to support transparency for parents and eligible students regarding their student PII and have processes in place to treat parents and students fairly. Um, one of the things that it does is it gives rights, like supporting parental rights surrounding um, their child's student PII. And it also um, supports fairness with consent. It requires parental consent before disclosing student PII, unless an exception applies. As we said, there's a number of exceptions to this requirement for parental consent before disclosing student data. One of those is gonna be that school official exception we mentioned. And in practice, these exceptions are gonna be used far more than obtaining consent will be. So starting off with what FERPA protects, it protects personally identifiable information from education records from unauthorized disclosure. That PII can include direct identifiers. Now that is something that has a one-to-one -one relationship between the data and the individual. So for example, I'm the only person with my social security number, so that's a direct identifier, but many people might share something like a birth date with me. It's October 9th, by the way, if there's any other Libras here, that is an indirect identifier because we have the same birthday. Um, we all might also have the same zip code, but in combination, some of these could uniquely identify someone. The um, educational record, that's records that are directly related to a student and maintained by an educational agency or institution or by a party acting for the agency or institution. So that's you. If you are collecting data from a student or about a student, it's probably going to meet this definition. Um, most records that you're providing to a school are going to be covered under this. So probably, I mean, a safe thing to do is you can assume it's an educational record under FERPA, you know, unless proven otherwise. If you have a profile on a student that has their name, their student ID number, and it also has something like their math scores, then that entire record is going to be an education record. It won't be that some pieces of it are or aren't. These are some of the rights that we talked about under FERPA. So there's the right to an annual notification to a school's FERPA policy. Um, so they will kind of, schools will hopefully be proactive about explicitly including, you know, vendors and ed tech, list out the information um, for what's going to be shared. Um, this access is the right of access to review and inspect student education records. So this is a big one that you're going to need to be able to facilitate. If you are holding education records, you need to be ready to comply. If a school comes to you and says, you know, we need to share this information so we can give it to a parent. Um, if you're not able to do that, that's going to be a big problem under FERPA. Um, and this, I mean, this request could be very broad. It could say, I want every single thing you have about my child. Um, and you might have to put something together under a school request. So this is a big one to be aware of. Um, there's also the right to request correction or amendment of a child's education records. And this is related to the one above. Um, the school will have a process to make changes to the record. And as a vendor, that's part of that, um, that, that will be part of your obligations under FERPA. And the school might say, we need you to change this record. So you need to be able to change things in your system in order to be able to support a school under FERPA. And also um, that consent we talked about, that's to prevent preventing the disclosure of um, PII from education records without consent, unless an exception applies. Um, this is what uh, FERPA says about consent. Um, the parental consent is necessary before disclosing PII from educational records. The school has to specify the records that are going to be disclosed, state the purpose of the disclosure, and identify the party or class of parties to whom the disclosure may be made. 
most of the time, an exception is going to make more sense. So most of the time, what a vendor is going to do is going to be to follow an exception to the requirement for consent. Um, consent really only happens in more specific cases, um, and it's on the school. It's the school's responsibility to obtain that parental consent. Um, but this is the general rule. Um, most of the time, there will be an exception, especially the school official exception. So that is what we are going to focus on. So we discussed that under FERPA, parental consent is needed before disclosing student data unless an exception applies. There's a number of exceptions, but these two, the school official exception and the directory information, ex information exception are the most common for your purposes. Um, and overwhelmingly, the school official exception will be the one that most vendors fall into. Pay attention to these exceptions. And if the end, you know, if at the end of the presentation you're thinking, well, neither of these exceptions really fit our business model, then you might need to go the parental consent route um, and you might need to um, obtain that. Schools uh, can use the school official exception to disclose education records to a third party provider if the provider. Uh, meets all of these requirements. Um, number one, uh, if the provider performs a service or function for the school or district for which the school or district would otherwise use their own employees. If the provider is under the direct control of the organization, this might be achieved through something like a contract. If the provider uses education data in a manner consistent with the definition of the school official with a legitimate educational interest. And if the provider does not redisclose or use education data for unauthorized purposes, things that do not align with the original purpose that was agreed upon, um, or of course, anything that violates the above three bullet points. The school official exception, think of this as to how, like, in order to provide you proper health care, your doctor needs to share certain information with your pharmacy, your insurer, the testing lab, the company that hosts their electronic patient system. All of those other providers need to be able to review that information in order to be able to do their job. Um, so that kind of comes back to the school service or function that the school would use their own employees for. That legitimate educational interest is um, a big part of this. And this comes back to um, a school official has a legitimate educational interest if the official needs to review an education record in order to fulfill his or her professional responsibility. So the information is to be used within the context of official agency or school business. It's not supposed to be used for purposes that are extraneous to the official's areas of responsibility or to the agency of the school. Um, the information needs to be relevant to the accomplishment of some task or to some determination about the student. And it, it should be used consistently with the purpose for which the data are maintained. So any other purposes, if you have like additional commercial purposes, even if these are in a student's best interest, um, you know, if you have some kind of marketing purposes, this might not be something that's going to fall under this exception um, because it might not be something, you know, that comes back to that the school would otherwise use its own employees for. Um, the second most common exception that you're going to see to FERPA, it's this directory information exception. Um, so if we keep in mind, FERPA was created in the 70s, so we didn't have the internet. Directory information is what would allow like the phone 
you know, the, the, the school phone book lists, um, any kind of academic awards that might be published in graduation programs, or if there's stats from student athletes um, that would be released to the local paper, that's the kind of thing that this covers. It's information contained in an education record that wouldn't generally be considered harmful or an invasion of privacy if it's disclosed. Um, so keep in mind that while some data that you collect might be directory information, this is extremely strict. So if you have some directory information and then it becomes combined with, again, we're gonna use that math score example, then it's no longer directory information. So it's very hard to rely on this exception. Um, the school is also the one who gets to decide what directory information is. So a vendor can't say, you know, we only collect this, this, and this. It's all directory information. The school will have their own definition of what constitutes directory information. And so they would have to agree to that. And for this example, the school would also have to collect opt-outs from parents, which we will get to in a second, and you would have to honor those. So this exception really makes sense for something like that's very public. Um, but in 90% or in most cases, I think the school official exception might be more, more applicable um, to many vendors. So here are some exceptions to this directory information um, exception, exceptions to the exception. Uh, annual notice has to be given to parents um, and then students and parents, they can choose to opt out of the disclosure of directory information. So like I said, if this is a, um, a, an, an exception that you're using, uh, you're going to have to honor any opt outs. And the opt out applies only to the directory information sharing. It doesn't mean that the parent that opts out of directory information is opting out of any information sharing under any other FERPA exception. So opting out of this exception wouldn't opt a student out of um, you know, a legitimately required district tool. Um, also note that schools may adopt a limited directory information policy that allows for the disclosure of directory information to specific parties or for specific purposes. One way to support schools obligations under FERPA is to apply to the Student Privacy Pledge, the principles of which were designed specifically to comply with FERPA and with many other state laws. So if you are not already a signatory, be on the lookout for more information on the Student Privacy Pledge um, from my colleague, Daniel, very soon. I know that was a lot that we covered, um, so we definitely want to make sure that we are leaving time um, to honor any any questions that anyone might have. We have a, a Q and A question in the chat, but uh, I think that we're going to hold that till after the COPPA and security section and handle those together. Thank you so much, Alexa, for that great presentation. Um, you covered a lot of the content that I will be returning to when I talk about the student privacy pledge. So I very much appreciate that. We are now going to turn to uh, our senior technologist, Jim Siegel, to do a presentation on COPPA and security. And I do believe that he is going to be covering some of the uh, things that we are seeing in what COPPA may become uh, when this most recent NPRM goes into, in, into effect. So take it away, Jim. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, happy to have a chance to, to talk with you today. My name is Jim Siegel. I'm a senior technologist here at Future of Privacy Forum. Before that, for about 20 years, I was the technology architect for Fairfax County Public Schools, one of the, the larger school districts in the country. And most of my work involved the, the approving, the evaluating, and the onboarding 
of, of ed tech across that very large uh, school system. Um, so spent a lot of time working with ed tech companies, uh, with reading privacy policies and talking about um, some of the, the things that, uh, that we'll be talking about today about FERPA, COPPA and uh, data protection agreements. So um, I, I think that, uh, that you can um, give me a reaction there. I just wanna get a little bit of sense of, of who's in the room um, thinking about this next topic. So um, if you can, if you have the ability to give a thumbs up, if you um, are a, an ed tech uh, company that's, that works with uh, students in schools that are under 13 years of age, give me a, give me a thumbs up. Okay, great, good to, to hear from folks. Um, so COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act is a law that applies to you. It applies to companies that collect data from children that are under 13 um, or that uh, operate sites that are directed to children under 13, as many of, of EdTech's products are um, in schools. Typically, um, uh, eighth grade, usually that, that line between seventh and eighth grade is pretty common for that, that cutoff for, for age uh, 12 and 13. Or you could be um, a, an ed tech service provider, a third party network, an, uh, a plugin, for example, and you have um, actual knowledge that you're on a that you're on a site that's directed to students to children under thirteen. Um, so, COPPA is is one of the more significant privacy laws that we encounter in the ed tech space, um, and it has a number of requirements um, for for vendors. So. It requires something called a direct notice, and that's really very different than a, a privacy policy. And we'll get to talking about privacy policies um, in a bit with COPPA and, and, and later when Daniel talks about the pledge. Um, but the direct notice is something very specific that is provided to the parents of, uh, of children under 13 or in schools when schools are standing in the parents' shoes um, for providing consent. And it provides information about the operator's um, practices for collecting data. Um, as part of COPPA, one of the most significant things is there's a requirement to get um, verified parental consent. Um, and that has to happen before any data is collected from the child or when you make a material change, when you make a significant change to your data collection practices. And we'll talk more about how verifiable parental consent works in the school context in a minute, but want to tee up really these five major points. So verifiable parental consent, that direct notice. Um, like FERPA, there is a requirement to provide parents with access to their child's uh, personal information, give the opportunity to withdraw that consent um, in the, the parent context, um, and no longer uh, collect that information and, and put on retention limitations. So. COPPA is pretty significant in that it has some significant penalties and is enforced by the Federal Trade Commission. So there can be violations of, of up to more than $50,000 per violation. Um, and that is per violation, which is per each, each individual. And there have been some pretty significant uh, COPPA settlements um, in the last couple of years, a $170 million settlement um, against YouTube back um, in 2019, and um, a, a more recent settlement against the first ed tech company that had a copper violation that we'll talk about in a minute or two. Um, really, when you think about COPPA and the role of the schools in terms of providing that verifiable parental consent, it's really based on some pretty Thin language. So there was um, a, a paragraph um, in uh, the Congressional Register uh, back in uh, 1999 that simply said that there is nothing in this rule that says that schools can act as intermediaries for getting parental consent or acting as the parent's agent in the process. And those, those two terms, um, which are not defined anywhere, intermediaries and parent agent, are really the whole basis for how the role of schools and COPPA have, have kind of come together in the last 24 years um, in terms of schools being able to, to act as the parent's agent or their intermediary. So 
schools can provide consent on behalf of parents. It's acting as the parent's agent, um, really in a very narrow set of circumstances. So it's really if all of these things are true. So if if the school is contracting with the vendor and um, there is no definition for what contracting means, um, it can be uh, an actual formal contract. Um, it could be a, cl a click through terms of service agreement. Um, but if they're contracting, if the school is contracting with the vendor um, and the school is thinking about and following all of their other obligations under FERPA and the several state student privacy laws that have come into being in the last 10 or 11 years. And then on your side, on the ed tech provider side, that you're using that data for the sole benefit of the school or the student, basically for that educational purpose and no other commercial purpose. Um, and that no other commercial purpose um, is, a, is a pretty specific definition. Um, so you also have to provide all the, all the COPPA notifications, the direct notice, the online notice and privacy policy that you would have had to provide to the parent. You have to provide that to, to the school that's, that, that's authorizing, that's standing in the parent's stead um, and acting as the parent's agent. Um, you have to make sure that you follow uh, data limitation, data minimization and data retention. You don't keep that data any longer than is needed to provide that educational service and comply with all of the other COPPA requirements. So this has created some challenges, especially the confusion between acting as the parent's agent, where you're, you're authorizing on behalf of the parent, and that intermediary role, um, which is, again, not defined, but essentially is where the school could be collecting that information, the permission, and, and and sending it on to, to the vendor. And this, this intermediary versus parent agent crops up a lot in ed tech company terms of service. And this is a, a pretty common example of terms that, that we see um, and that are problematic. And so a couple of things that are problematic here is the word solely responsible for complying with COPPA. And, and, and this is a common, uh, common mistake that, that ed tech companies make in their privacy policy. So, this attempts to transfer the responsibility and the liability of complying with COPPA to the school. And that's not something that's possible. COPPA doesn't apply to schools. COPPA applies to commercial entities. It applies to ed tech providers. Um, you can't contract your way out of your obligations. Um, one of the, and this is written in the, the frame of the school acting as the intermediary. And that might not be obvious in, in, in um, the way that the terms are written, but if you look at things like, you must obtain advanced written consent from all parents or guardians. So that's that's acting as the intermediary, getting that permission from them. If they were act, if the school was acting as the parent's agent, they that wouldn't need to get that permission from the parents. They're acting as their agent and providing consent directly. Um, this is also attempting to essentially contractually obligate the school to act as the vendor's agent as a record keeper. You must keep all consents on file and provide them to us if we request them. So these are some problematic terms and, and it actually, these the terms very similar to this came up in the the Edmodo settlement, which it was the, the, the first and only uh, FTC uh, settlement against an ed tech company. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So the Federal Trade Commission um, is the enforcer of COPPA and they have been particularly proactive in terms of looking at the, the ed tech space in the last couple of years. So um, two years ago, they put out a policy statement that said, you know, we're uh, providing additional scrutiny um, and um, oversight of of ed tech in schools. This was relatively soon after the pandemic, where we saw an enormous um, influx of ed tech into schools. And they really focus on four things, um, use prohibitions, retention prohibitions, security, um, and prohibition against mandatory collection. And what we mean by that is use prohibitions are um, making the, uh, the use of the product contingent on collecting more data than is necessary for using um, the, the, the ed tech application. 
um, retention, keeping the data longer than is necessary, um, or even keeping it indefinitely. Um, security requirements, uh, it's, 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 it's hard to imagine that, that, that you wouldn't be familiar with the enormous pressure that schools have been under in the last five years from threats like ransomware. Um, uh, ed tech and school, K-12 schools in particular are one of the hardest hit um, industries in terms of security and ransomware. And the, the FTC has um, uh, uh, filed multiple settlements against a variety of the companies um, in, in all industries for insufficient security as, a, as an unfair practice. So typically that involves having some kind of a security plan, plan more than just what we would see as reasonable security. So the Edmodo settlement, um, and Edmodo was a learning management platform um, that um, was provided to K-12 schools under two of the, the common business models that we see in EdTech. It was provided as what I would call a freemium, a freemium model where um, the product is provided uh, for free or as trialware to, to teachers at a classroom level um, in the hopes of uh, the second business model, which is uh, selling um, a school or a district level um, enterprise uh, license to the schools. And this, the settlement really kind of um, pulled back the curtain on those two approaches where schools can interact and provide that COPPA consent um, for vendors, first acting as the parent's agent, um, and that's what we see here on, on the left, or is acting in as, as the intermediaries. And the settlement basically found fault with the way that Edmodo handled both of those. So the first one where, um, and this would be in that, that enterprise model, where the school or the district was going to be acting as the parent's agent. And the problem with that one was that they didn't provide uh, the, the direct notice, they didn't provide the notices. But even beyond that, um, the Edmodo product um, had contextual advertising. So that's that's different than behavioral or targeted advertising. So it's advertising that is just kind of based on what's happening on the page or advertising that is just served to, to anyone that's using that, that site or that service. But the Federal Trade Commission looked at that and said, you're, you're providing advertising. That advertising is, is its own commercial purpose that's not related to the ed tech service. So because you have another commercial use, of that product that's unrelated, that voids, that makes it inel the school ineligible to provide that parent agent consent. So the school wouldn't have been able to use this, uh, the vendor wouldn't have been able to use the school as a, as a parent agent in that. They would have had to either use the school as an intermediary or get consent directly from the parents. And then when the FTC looked at the, the way that Edmodo was handling the intermediary role, they found a number of failures. They didn't inform the teachers and the schools that they had this intermediary role, and they didn't make um, what were called reasonable efforts. They didn't make, they didn't really follow up at all with the school to make sure that the school had sent that information to the parents um, or that they had actually gotten that. Um, and I'm, I'm going to just give you my opinion on this one. When you think about the intermediary role, I would be extremely cautious in using this role um, as a method of verifiable parental consent. Um, the way that the FTC looks at verifiable parental consent is they have approved six different methods of verifiable parental consent. Uh, printing out a form and sending it via fax, which is I think a pretty good um, uh, sense that this law was created in the late 90s. Um, uh, calling a call center or doing a video call, uh, charging a credit card for a nominal fee, or um, really the only uh, modern example of a verifiable parental consent, um, which was approved eight years ago, taking a picture of your driver's license and then using um, a mobile device to take a selfie and then comparing those two to verify the identity of the parent. Um, if you'll notice, using the school to get a permission slip from the parent and then hold on to that permission slip isn't an example of an approved verifiable parental method um, that's been pre-approved by the FTC. So 
Um, I, I think you should be very cautious in using this role because it really needs to be able to meet all of the standards of the other methods of verifiable parental consent. So um, a good question on this one would be, how would you handle if a parent called and said, I want to uh, uh, you know, stop uh, collecting data? Would you, you would probably need to redirect them back to the school um, but you don't necessarily, you don't have that information to verify that they are the parent if the school is the one that's holding on uh, to that permission slip. So the, the, the school as, as, as intermediary is a very problematic um, approach to this. Um, so I think you really want to think very carefully um, about this approach. So um, as I mentioned, the Edmodo settlement, it was, it was a $6 million fine and it banned the schools from using the schools as intermediaries going forward. Now this settlement applied only to Edmodo, but I think um, all of us that look at this kind of try and read the, the tea leaves and figure out where the FTC is going with enforcement. Um, and certainly that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm particularly skeptical of, of that, that intermediary approach. Um, so some takeaways, um, you know, definitely look at their, uh, the, the, the FTC's policy on um, on ed tech um, and um, just keep in mind that you can't pass um, your responsibility for complying with COPPA um, onto the schools. And I would encourage you to, to read up and take a look at what direct notices are. Um, these are different than, your, than, than an online privacy policy. It's, it's, it's something that's sent to the person that's authorizing it on behalf of, of, of the school. Um, and they have some very specific requirements. And I read a lot of privacy policies and I've tested a lot of ed tech applications over the years. And I can say there are very few ed tech companies that are actually doing this right. So this is of all of the things related to COPPA, um, I would pay special attention um, to, the, to the to direct notices. Um, and another reason why it's important to pay uh, special attention is uh, the times are changing. And the COPPA rule, which was passed in 1998, um, and, mo and recently updated, most recently updated in 2013, is due for another update. So right before uh, the December holidays, the FTC put out a proposed draft of a new rule, um, and they accepted comments on it up until mid-March. And there are a number of significant changes. Um, one of them is they have um, formalized the role of the school as the parent's agent. So it's, it's really been kind of an informal process for the last 24 years. So there is now official language proposed in the rule. Um, the other thing that's a big change is there are much, much more detailed requirements around data security um, and uh, restrictions for, for data retention. So the first piece that ed tech companies really need to look at, and again, I wanna mention, this is a proposed rule um, and we will see where this rule ends up. Um, as a final rule, probably in the next six to nine months. Um, but in general, if you look back at, at 2013, what the FTC put out in their proposed rule, about 95% of it stayed when we saw the final rule. So as you're building ed tech products, um, I think it's important to keep where the trends are going in mind. So the, the, the proposed rule uses the term a school authorized educational purpose. And I think if you think back just a few minutes ago to my colleague Alexa was talking about the school official exception, the goal was to really align this COPPA term of school authorized educational purpose with the school official exception. Um, and you can see many of the, the same key concepts are here. A school authorized purpose um, uh, that's related to the student's education. Um, an important piece is that this includes maintaining, developing, supporting, and improving the service that the school is contracting for. So this would be the, you know, the, uh, the reading program that you're um, licensing to the school. It wouldn't include using that data to create new, um, uh, new products. And you'll hear a little bit more about that when my colleague David talks about AI in a little bit. Um, there is a requirement, and this is a new requirement for what's called a written agreement. Um, again, this was not defined in the proposed rule, so it could mean a contract or a data protection agreement, or it could mean click-through terms of service, 
So this is something we're keeping a very careful eye on. Do we get a definition for this and how might it apply to click through terms of service? But most importantly, and I think this is really going to have the biggest impact on edtech companies, is the written agreement is delivered to the person that is authorizing on behalf of the school as part of that direct notice that it lists the name and the title of the person who's providing authorization. And, and they're attesting that they have the authority to contract on behalf of the school to release data. I will tell you, as someone that worked for 20 years in one of the largest school districts, I did not have the authority to sign contracts. Very few of my colleagues and certainly very few, uh, I'm, I wasn't aware of any teachers um, that had the authority to contract on behalf of the district. Um, so this one is going to be a particularly interesting to see where this ends up. Um, but it has uh, some of the other things that Alexa talked about in the, in the school official exception, limiting the disclosure in the youth to that school purpose and, and emphasizing that as with the, the school official exception, that at, as the ed tech company that you're under the school's direct control. There are going to be some pretty significant implications that we don't know for sure. But one question that we have, and, and, and just looking at where this is going, that written agreement seems to imply, nothing changes, that when the rule comes into effect, which is probably going to be about six to nine months after the, the final rule is released, that if you're an ed tech company and you have data on a student that would be covered by COPPA, so a, a, a collected from a student under 13, that you're gonna have to have one of two things that you have to do. You're either gonna have to go and get a written agreement from the school that complies with whatever that final definition of the written agreement is, or you're going to have to delete that data. That seems to be the logical um, implications of how the, the written agreement um, and the language in the rule was written. Um, I mentioned how important the direct notice is and the direct notice is a, is a current COPPA requirement, but it's even more significant and, and has um, even more specifics um, in the proposed rule. Um, really looking at number three on this one, um, really important pieces of information that you're required to list. So listing the items of personal information that you're planning on, on collecting from, from the child, from the student. So individual data elements, how you intend to use that and the potential um, opportunities for disclosing that information, either to third parties um, or, or any other disclosures that you might have. Um, so the direct notice is going to be even more important in the future. Um, you're also required to have an online notice. This could be your privacy policy, but there that has been um, enhanced in terms of um, additional information that you have to list. So verifying that you have obtained that authorization um, and that you'll only use it for school purposes. And it's also going to have to have your, um, your deletion schedule and the procedures for doing that. So when we think about the the about COPPA and the conversations that we had um, at the, the at, um, just a few minutes ago um, in in FERPA, there are some potential areas of conflict. So thinking about the difference between that school authorized um, definition and uh, FERPA school official, and most importantly, for the for the ed tech vendor, COPPA has um, the ability to disclose information that would cause or potentially cause a school to be in violation of FERPA. And I think you want to think about this very carefully, because I'm sure as, as ed tech providers and service providers to schools, you don't want to potentially force them into something that could cause them to violate FERPA, which would have the ultimate penalty of, of, of losing funding from the Department of Ed. Um, and that's things like there's uh, FERPA allows you to uh, disclose information to protect the security of the website or the integrity of the user, and that's often considered safety. Um, and for, uh, Alexa uh, mentioned that there were several exceptions to FERPA, and two of them that relate to this are um, the law enforcement exception and the health and safety exception. Um, so FERPA has some very specific requirements in terms of the process, when is a school allowed to disclose information in a health and safety uh, emergency or to law enforcement. And it's possible that um, in following COPPA, what they're allowed to do under COPPA, an operator could cause the school that's giving them the consent under COPPA 
to violate HERPA. And I think that's um, going to be a particular challenge. Um, there are a number of other areas um, that could be a conflict between COPPA and FERPA um, and some other challenges. I mentioned the written agreement that, that that's not defined. FERPA actually uses that same term and it has a, a very different definition. Um, when we think about data retention, um, COPPA um, has restrictions, but really under FERPA with the school official exception, um, the school needs to drive um, the, the data retention. There are a number of new security requirements, um, and this really goes beyond the level of um, just simply reasonable security. Um, so it requires uh, or, or likely will require um, an ed tech provider to have a, what we would call a WISP, a written information security program, to have somebody in charge and designate someone in charge of security, to do um, annual security assessments and um, basically put in actions to respond to what you discovered in those assessments um, and to work with your third party providers to contract with them and make sure that they're able to maintain their security obligations as well. So um, this is a very significant addition to, um, to COPPA security requirements. On the data retention side, um, it's really data minimization and, and uh, really restricted data retention um, and to have your data retention policy in your information security policy. I think where this ends up is um, an area of, of interest in the final rule to see where the balance is between um, the desire to have um, limited data retention and how um, that relates to um, the school having direct control since many states um, have uh, state-related um, data retention policies, and it could differ by the type of information. Looking beyond the current COPPA rule and thinking about legislation that, that is pending at the federal level, um, there is an updated version of COPPA that is, that is pending in the current legislative session. Um, it has not passed, um, and I can't really speculate as to what the odds are that it would pass, but there's a lot of activity going around um, at the federal level on both comprehensive privacy and a huge interest in child privacy. So COPPA in particular, to keep an eye on if this does pass, would raise the age of, that COPPA applies to. So currently it is 12 and under, so it would expand this to teens, so uh, students that are 13 to 16. Um, and it would add uh, a number of other things, but the primary thing that would impact um, ed tech companies would be um, expanding that age to 16 and under. Going beyond COPPA, I just wanna briefly mention that in addition to FERPA and COPPA at the federal level, um, really some of the most significant protections um, in ed tech for, uh, for students and that apply to ed tech companies are the, the more than 120 laws that have passed in the last decade at the state level. Um, so 39 states have passed strong student privacy laws at the state level that cover both ed tech companies and, and schools. There are a number of common themes and there's a lot of variation between these laws, but in general, many of them have a requirement to designate um, a, a privacy or security officer, either for schools or for, uh, for ed tech companies. Overall, one of the most common prohibitions is a prohibition on behavioral advertising and creating non-education profiles um, and uh, adopting a, a cybersecurity framework. Um, so um, really wanted to close out and say beyond that, there are more than just the two federal laws that we've mentioned. Um, and with that, I'm going to, to stop sharing and to take us to our Q&A. And I see we've got a few questions in, um, in the question and answer. Daniel, do you want to walk us through our questions? And yeah, direct absolutely. it for either me or for Alexa. Yeah, so the first question we have, I believe, was related to uh, FERPA. And... Uh, the questioner asked, does supporting the editing of student records like name include when the data is imported directly from an SIS system? It 
So I I would think that an SIS system um, or an, an, an SIS will have its own um, agreements with how they're getting that data. So if you are importing data from them, what the it's going to in large part depend on the request. If you get a request that says like, we want everything that you have on our student, um, then even data that's just imported from you know another ed tech vendor is going to be something that you're you're going to need to support access to. Um, presumably, if if there it's something that is needing to be amended on on the student information system as well, um, then they will have also reached out to the to the to the student information system. Jim, is there any um, additional clarity you want to provide on this question? Yeah, so I, I think the question um, kind of keyed off on the requirement uh, for editing. And I did want to clarify that, that, that FERPA gives the parents the rights to inspect and uh, petition for the correction of the record. So it's not an absolute right to, to just edit or even directly edit. So there is no requirement in FERPA to give parents the right to edit you know, within their access to an information system. Um, and it, it, it is the school's responsibility to essentially adjudicate whether or not that's a valid request to correct. Awesome, thank you both. Uh, and if there are any uh, follow-up questions related to the answers we are providing, continue. Uh, feel free to continue posting that in the Q&A section. Uh, the next questioner, I think this was related to the, the COPPA presentation, asked what student information is considered to be COPPA compliant? Is it contact info and demographic info, age, et cetera, or is it also personality info? Uh, this questioner uh, is a public speaking and leadership academy. So um, they said that we asked them to fill out a survey around uh, I'm COPPA confident speaking on stage, I'm a leader or not, I feel heard and understood, et cetera. Is this okay? <laughs> Those are great questions. Um, so this, you always have to look at any question about student privacy in the context of kind of all of the, the laws that might apply, the ones that would apply to you as the vendor, but also what, what the, the school is. So for COPPA, COPPA applies to information that's collected directly from a, a, a child under 13. And it does, unlike FERPA, which is essentially anything that is um, directly uh, connected to the student or essentially linked or linkable is, is, is the term that's used. COPPA does list a set of, of specific data elements. The catch is that it also includes a permanent identifier like an IP address or or any other um, identifier and any information that's that's linked with that. So it's information that's collected directly from the child. Now, if you're working with a school and the school is the one that's providing the consent, you're also likely collecting FERPA information. So you you probably need to um, to be in in a, a contractor terms of service um, status with that school that you're basically also covering their FERPA obligations. Um, I'm not sure, and you can put in the chat, if this is maybe a case um, where this might be an after-school program and it's not related to a school, that's also a common thing. Um, so that might be a case where just COPPA applies. Um, and then I, I will mention one um, law that applies to schools, after school, okay, uh, but it can be both. So. Um, one other law that we didn't mention um, that applies to schools is uh, the, the Protection of Pupil Rights Act, which does come into play when there are uh, questions or surveys that are asking students um, uh, eight, eight cent, what are called sensitive topics. So you may need um, to talk to the school and if you're doing surveys, um, those are things that, that, uh, that require parental consent or opt out you're asking questions about uh, family finances, uh, religion, protected relationships, um, uh, sex behaviors, um, essentially um, rather sensitive topics. Um, and sometimes um, after school programs may kind of uh, veer into that area. Awesome, thank you. 
This next question, I believe, was in relation to um, the, the parent agent and in intermediaries part of your presentation, Jim. And the questioner asked, what can we have the parents sign if they enroll in our programs? I will let this uh, commenter um, uh, offer any more information, though, if I was wrong about the question they're asking. <laughs> Got it. Um, so this would be, I I'm going to assume that this one would be really just straight COPPA and not COPPA in a relationship with um with a school so it sounds like they're saying basically how do we get that that verifiable parental consent um so i had put in the the chat the the link to the ftc's uh frequently asked questions document um it's very detailed i i, I probably look at this twice a week um it talks a lot about the verifiable parental consent process um so typically um you would um uh if, if you're a site that is solely directed as a child directed site, you basically assume that that all users are under 13 and you basically treat treat all those users as, as under 13. Um, if you're dealing with um, uh, a, a mixed audience site, for example, where you have some where the, it's a child directed site, but there are some users that are are uh, are, are, are 13 or over. Then you might put in um, what's called an, an age gate, where you're asking them um, their uh, their birth date or, or or birth month and year in a in a neutral fashion. Obviously, asking them are you are 13 or over would not be a neutral way of, of asking that question. Um, and then once you know that, um, you basically have to collect information about their parent contact um, and um, do the verifiable parental consent process. That's a little bit beyond the, the, the scope of, of, of this boot camp. Um, so I direct you either to the, the, the FTC document um, that's, that's, that's in the frequently asked questions, um, or if one of my colleagues can pull um, the, the verifiable parental consent white paper uh, from FPF and put that in the chat as well um, while we're answering some of the questions, that'd be great. Yeah, that's great. Um, the next question that we have uh, is regarding uh, data retention. And the questioner asked, um, what time period is keeping data for longer than necessary? If the school district doesn't define what the data deletion policy should be, is there a default amount of time? I'm going to pass this to Alexa, um, but also give an opportunity for Jim to answer in case there's any state specific knowledge he can impart. Yeah, this is really, this is very state specific. Um, different states might have different data retention requirements for student data. Um, they might even have, I think Jim mentioned this, they might even have different retention policies for different types of data. So looking into the state law requirements for states where vendors are doing business is essential. Um, one of the things that we have that my colleague Daniel will talk about later um, in the pledge is we have a good best practice um, and we think that the good best practice for data retention is to not retain data beyond the time period required to support the un the authorized educational or school purpose um, or as authorized by the parent or student. That was awesome. Alexa already had the jump on me about talking about the states. <laughs> uh, moving on to the, the next question we have here. Um, the questioner asked, uh, what about all the software as a service tools? This is in relation to COPPA, by the way. What about all the software as a service tools we use, including Google tools? How do we uh, protect from that? Also, what if we hire contractors from the Philippines or India or other countries to edit student speech videos or analyze data, et cetera? How do we uh, protect from that in terms of COPPA? Um, sure. So, so under COPPA as, as the, essentially as the operator, you would need to signal to your third party that you are a, a COPPA covered site. Um, so then they would, they would have the obligation to follow COPPA as well. Um, so, uh, sorry, I think the question disappeared for me. Um, so there was something about, uh, about uh, SaaS products. So for example, um, storing storing this information in uh, in, in Google. Um, uh, so 
uh, if, if I were doing this, you know, I would look make sure that, you know, I wouldn't put this in the consumer version of, of, of Google, um, which has very different privacy policies in terms of service than um, something like the, the version that schools would use um, or, uh, or companies would use like the workspace product. Um, uh, if, uh, if there was something that I missed when the question disappeared, um, just put that back in the chat. Um, uh, got it, uh, Google surveys and, and, and Google Drive. Um, okay, yeah, makes sense. Um, certainly think about the kind of data that you're collecting through through Google surveys um, and who has access to it. Yeah, uh, so the next question we have is uh, from a questioner who's asking, how uh, do these requirements impact vendors who run after school programs? Can they use uh, the school for these privacy notifications or do they have to work directly with parents when it comes to after school programs? And I think that was in relation to COPPA. Okay, uh, sorry, I, I thought it was the school part, maybe it was uh, COPPA. Um, so they can, um, I would, you can go directly to the parents and, and I, I think that would be the, the smartest way of dealing with it. Um, based on the fact that the intermediate, Bailey would, would, it was really a question of, would you use the school as an intermediary? And I, I think I've, I've mentioned my skepticism about the intermediary role, but regardless, if you are using the school as the person collecting the permission slip, you need to receive the permission slip. Um, just any basic reasonable definition of the word intermediary means that there's somebody that moves something from one place to the other. Um, if the post office took your letter and held on to it, they would be a very bad intermediary. So you need to make sure that you can fulfill your legal obligations under COPPA um, if you're not in the school situation, if you're, if you're at the school program. So basically, can you provide the parent with their right to review the record to prevent future collection? Um, in which case, you actually have to have that permission slip. Awesome, thank you. And uh, Alexa, do you have anything to add from the FERPA side of that? Okay, cool. Uh, and then the next question we have is, uh, what is the scenario in which we are able to rely on the school to act as the decision maker? Um, so under the school official exception, and in that case, is the school still requ still required to provide notice for each use? Sorry, I'm just rereading the question. I'm, I, I think I'm a little bit confused about, about the question. Jim, do you um, have any color you can add here? Yeah, so it looks like we're talking about um, a traditional uh, school official exception case. And the, the question is, um, is the school required to provide notice that they're sharing data with that, that ed tech company? Um, and the answer is, for FERPA, there is no re no requirement. It is considered a best practice. And um, for the last de a decade ago, that has been the guidance from Department of Education, that it is a best practice uh, for schools to provide um, the information of who they're contracting with and possibly and potentially a link to that privacy policy. Now, as I mentioned, there are 120 uh, state student privacy laws in four fifths of the states that are out there. Some of them um, have very specific requirements. For example, New York um, and and uh, and several others have requirements that schools must list all of the ed tech providers um, and provide uh, a link to the contract or in New York the Parents Bill of Rights. Um, so it's hard. So in terms of FERPA, no, but it's a best practice. In terms of individual state laws, and again, the question is about what is the school required to do? Um, several states do have that requirement.
Thank you for that, Jim. And then clarification uh, on the kind of vague um, requirements for the school. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna. That was the last question we have in there right now. I'm gonna give a quick second in case anyone else has any last minute questions for these first two presentations. All right, thank you so much, uh, Jim and Alexa, for that. Um, it seems like it's time for us to move on to our next segment on uh, contracts and buyers and have a panel discussion there. And I'm really excited to turn to our expert panel to talk about the needs of the buyer in EdTech procurement, specifically EdTech adoption, vetting, and the role of contracts. This session will discuss the legal requirements from the buyers, and uh, by the buyers, I mean the school or school district point of view, what technology officers or other district representatives look for, and how contracts can be used to cover the legal obligations for both parties. First, let's introduce our panelists, and we have quite the brain trust here with, uh, with us today. Um, we have Rama Holly from the Education Cooperative. We have Melissa Tebenkamp uh, with MBBT Solutions. We have Andrea Tejador, uh, who is a data privacy consultant. But before we turn to our questions, I do want to give our panelists a quick opportunity to introduce themselves and their backgrounds in a little bit more depth to give some context on their extensive experience in education and privacy. So first, let's hear from Rama and then Melissa, and then we'll turn it over to Andrea. Great. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming today. I'm Rama Hawley. I work for the Education Cooperative. We're also known as Tech. We are a Massachusetts nonprofit school collaborative. We exist to help school districts do things together collaboratively to achieve more than they might be able to on their own because of lack of money, lack of human resources. In 2016, we were asked by our districts to put together a program to help districts secure signed student data privacy agreements with their digital providers. And today we offer that service to districts in eight states. Thank you. I am Melissa Tebenkamp. Um, just until recently, last July, I was the CTO for a medium-sized school district just right outside of Kansas City, Missouri. And um, that was a phenomenal experience. And lots of um, work on contracts and the vendor negotiations. I oversaw both the operational side and the instructional side. So every system that came into the district that used data came through my desk. And as I said, after 17 years, I decided to transition into the consulting role and now work with data privacy and cybersecurity um, since last July. Andrea, I think we lost you. Uh, we're going through it. Could you take a minute and introduce yourself? Oh, thank you. My, my computer crashed, so, so sorry about that. Um, my name is Andrea Tejador. I'm a former assistant superintendent for curriculum instruction and technology for a school district in New York State, and now working with um, uh, ed tech vendors as well as school districts around privacy and data, and, and data concerns. Awesome, thank you all for being here. Uh, let's dive into some discussion of the needs of the buyer, starting with ed tech adoption and vetting. There's a large ecosystem in the education technology space that uh, and that ecosystem includes roles and spaces for schools and for parents. Uh, although these two groups are sometimes separate in that there will be applications uh, or products explicitly marketed for schools and some explicitly marketed for parents, such as individual tutoring software, there's also a space in between, uh, in between there where sometimes certain vendors offer products that are free for schools, but parents have to pay for similar or additional services. So uh, this question is for Melissa and Andrea to start. What issues does this present in practice to have these products that are free for schools, but parents have to pay for similar or additional services? 
Go ahead, Melissa. <laughs> okay, I'll get started. Um, I was just having this conversation the other day with a vendor. On paper, it sounds really great. I think where our challenge is, is how do we communicate that through transparency and not raise more questions? Are the parents then really paying for the school to use this tool? If it is optional for parents, then are you charging me more so you can you know, make it free to this school? Or how are they making money if I'm not supporting it? And, and we have these parent concerns that come up. And, and helping the district answer those questions and those concerns will be incredibly critical. And, and you know, the district doesn't want to throw the vendor under the bus and say, well, this is how they're doing it. So that communication needs to be there. How do we justify that pricing structure and that model and have the transparency about what's happening with our data? Andrea, did you have? Tra transparency is definitely the first thing that comes to mind. Absolutely. And the other thing I think about are equity concerns. Because when parents are required to pay for enhanced features or content or just to um, access the application, it can create disparities uh, among students or exacerbate existing disparities. So, you know, those families that can afford the additional services may have access to more comprehensive learning tools or support, um, potentially leading to unequal educational experience for the students. Um, if it's really essential to the education of the student, then all students need to have access to that tool or those tools, um, and the school needs to assume that responsibility. You know, the other thing is that free versions of EdTech products a lot of times come with strings attached. And, um, you know, we want to be transparent about what the difference is between the free version and the paid version for the schools and the parents in terms of the types of data that are being collected or if they're being saved differently or if there's differences in terms of how um, student data is being used in those instances. Yeah, that's really interesting. And uh, as I was saying before, uh, there's a large ecosystem involved in uh, vendor procurement with schools, but uh, even within uh, schools, there can be a pretty large ecosystem that we're dealing with there where there's a lot of players in the game. There's uh, school administrators who might be trying to source products for their employees. There could be tech employees that are trying to manage that process. There may even be teachers that want to reach out because there's a specific products that they see that would be useful in their classroom. So my next question is, uh, what should vendors do if they receive outreach from multiple individuals within the same district regarding the adoption or use of EdTech products? And uh, because I mentioned parents before, I think it would be really helpful to also hear um, what your point of view is about outreach from parents. Uh, I, I will say the first question out of the from the vendor side would be who is authorized to sign your contracts and then start with that person and ask them who they would like for you to work with. Um, I oftentimes had the department head if it was an operational system or the instructional leader if it was an instructional system, but it wasn't the teacher. It was the instructional leader responsible for that curriculum area involved in the discussions, involved in the negotiation, making sure that we're meeting their needs as well, but all of the contracts came through me. And I did not want to be bypassed in that process at all. And so start with the person who can authorize the contract because one, you can find that you're going way down the line and spending a lot of time with somebody and then it not go anywhere. And then as far as the parents, just send them, once you know who that contact person is, you send them back to the contact person in the district. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you want to, I'll start with contacted by parents. You want to be able to direct the parents to speak to somebody in the district that can really answer those questions. Um, you don't want to get into a conversation about their student's record. There could be issues around FERPA, um, OCAPA, or the state regulations. Um, and you don't want to get caught in the middle of disclosing um, information that should not be disclosed. Um, also, in terms of like district, Districts all operate so differently. Um, some have a very centralized way of purchasing um, ed tech tools. Others have a very decentralized way where it's handled at the building level. Um, if there's going to be 
if you're going to be entering into a contract with the school district, um, the school district's always going to run it by legal counsel. That's, that's always going to happen. So you really want to talk to that person in the district that has contact with legal counsel in terms of reviewing the contract and the requirements. Um, the conversation could potentially start at a building level with a principal or even with a teacher, um, but you need to establish who's that um, end person that I need to get approval from in order to have that conversation to ensure that the contract's been approved and I can move the, the sale for, forward ultimately. Um, but you know, it may take a couple steps to get there um, because you maybe um, have a, somebody from a school reach out to you, but ultimately you really wanna have that conversation with and that one point of a contact established um, with the person who's going to be able to sign the contract and work with legal counsel to have it approved. Thank you, that's really helpful because uh, like I said, it's a large ecosystem, it's hard to navigate and so having these steps uh, is certainly helpful information. Um, in uh, the Q&A for our few previous presentations, this, this was hit on a little bit of like different uh, categories of ed tech products and making a distinction between after school programs and uh, uh, ed tech services that are used for, for uh, various needs. Um, so Melissa, I'm very interested, uh, based on your experience, what are the most challenging categories of ed tech products in thinking about adopting and vetting vendors for schools? And uh, why were these the most challenging categories? Ooh, you're going to get me in trouble here. So um, my hardest, I, I would say the most challenging categories fall into one of two. Um, one, one, like systems that are required by specific grants or sometimes by specific states for program alignment. Um, there are states out there that will say, here's grant money, you apply for the grant money, and then they're like, this is a system you're gonna use to collect this data or, or to implement this curriculum. Those can become problematic if they're not vetted at that initial level. And then we reach out to the companies to get that compliant contract in place because we still have to be compliant with FERPA regardless of who initiated the funding or the grant. And we have difficulty getting that contract in place, getting those data privacy agreements or the language that we need for compliance. Those can be challenging. However, that said, many of them are targeting our K-12 students with these grants and they understand the need for that language. It's just getting that data sharing. If we're sharing back with the grantee, making sure all of that data is in the right place. More challenging recently, I would say in the last three to four years have been the programs that are targeted towards adults, but K-12 institutions use them for career and technology ed or some of our advanced classes at the high school. Because these programs are targeted towards adult learners, it becomes challenging on having direct control. Oftentimes the school cannot have direct control over the data because it's a certificate program that stays with that learner throughout their career, their professional career as well, and getting those contracts in place. And how do we make that language clear and concise and have the correct level of permissions and authority in language? And oftentimes it's a series of contracts and a series of permissions in order to get us um, to, to a compliant contract where we can stay in compliance with FERPA and the vendor can stay in compliance with their data sharing as well um, and their licensures. Um, I, I would say those two buckets tend to be the most challenging. If you asked me 10 years ago, I would say free. Applications were, were probably the most challenging for us, but we've seen that landscape change a lot. And we know that there's even if it's free to schools, there's some model there that allows us to enter into a, a contracted agreement. And those have become less cumbersome, at least through my experience. But we also tend to pay for things versus the free items as well in our district. Yeah, thank you. And I'm really happy that I heard you talking about contracting and uh, the role of data uh, privacy agreements in there a little bit, because that is another big chunk of, of the puzzle. Um, and I actually want to turn to Rayma real quick and have, uh, you described it a little bit in your introduction, but can you describe uh, a little bit more about what your organization, the Education Cooperative, does and uh, the structure of the National Data Privacy Agreement? Sure. 
So my organization works with school districts to secure signed data privacy agreements with their vendors. So we, um, we look to those districts to tell us which DPAs they need with which vendors, and we go out and we do all the work to secure those agreements. We use the SDPC National Data Privacy Agreement. It's been um, in existence for about three to four years. It's used by about 25 states. It is, um, the way it's structured is the first 20 some pages of the DPA are standard clauses and they are federal laws and the lowest common de denominator of state laws. And this is the same, no matter what state is using the national DPA from SDPC, those standard clauses are identical. And then each state, if they have unique state laws, some states don't, the majority do, will use something that we call Exhibit G to add their state laws into that data privacy agreement. So in my instance, I'm servicing eight states. So when I use the national DPA, it has eight Exhibit Gs, one for each of my states. Um, the vendor community really appears to like this model. They've seen that national DPA, the standard clauses from dozens of states, they know it, they've seen it, they've signed it before. So it really streamlines the process from, for them. So five, six years ago, every state was using their own DPA and even some districts were using different DPAs throughout the state. So that was really hard for vendors. They had to devote a great deal of time and money to pay legal folks to review all these different DPAs. So now with the national DPA, they've seen it, they know it. When they receive it, all they need to do is review that, ex that unique Exhibit G from that state if they haven't seen it before. So... Um, it has saved a lot of time and money for both vendors and school districts. This data privacy agreement also includes another exhibit that we call Exhibit E. It is a general offer of privacy terms. And what it provides is the ability for any district in that particular state where that DPA was signed to piggyback on that DPA. So now, not only does the vendor only have to review one national DPA standard clause set, but just one for the state because all the other districts in that state can just hop on to that one DPA that the vendor signed. In my case, the vendor has signed a DPA with eight states. So any district within those eight states that participates in the program can then piggyback on that eight state DPA, further streamlining, further saving time for everyone involved. That's awesome. It sounds much needed and extremely beneficial uh, given uh, the environment in which we're, we're operating. Uh, and I want to open this next one up to uh, everyone on the panel, um, kind of bouncing off of what Raymo was just explaining uh, what are you looking for when you review a data privacy agreement? Uh, this is going to be a three-part question, so so let me know if you need me to repeat any of the parts. Uh, so first one, uh, what are you looking for when you review a data privacy agreement? Uh, second part, which uh, national data privacy agreement clauses draw the most commentary and changes from vendors? And, and the third re related part is uh, how do those two previous answers impact your work? Do you want me to go first? I, I think yeah, I can. No <laughs> so um, I will leave reviewing data privacy policies to Melissa and Andrea. Um, but when it comes to the National Data Privacy Agreement, the, the clause that seems to give vendors the most pause is there's an auditing section about um, this, the school district's right to audit a vendor. And one of the main reasons that that's in the DPA is if a federal or state authority were to audit a school district and as a part of that audit, wanted to audit their partner vendors, 
that vendor has to allow that authority to do that audit. If they don't, there'd be a finding, there could be a finding against the school district. So I mentioned that we're using the national DPA version one. So version two has just recently been um, released. It's not been adopted yet, but it will be by many of these 20 some states. And it does have um, a more defined and uh, more palatable audit clause in that version of the DPA. And then did you ask what we do if the vendor needs red lines? Was that part of the question that I heard? No, but okay. I would like that answer if you can provide it, because sure. I think that's certainly okay. an important perspective. Okay, so if a vendor reads the DPA and they see that um, there's certain parts of it that don't fit their product exactly or don't fit their business model exactly, we will entertain red lines. Um, we will show those to our attorney for her to review. She will negotiate back and forth with that particular vendor. But what we really want to stress is that it really needs to be the product or the service that just doesn't fit the, the national template. We run into a lot of vendors that, um, you know, it's just kind of attorney style. They want to wordsmith a little bit. Those we discourage. It really needs to be a unique fit that the DPA just doesn't meet. And that's when we'll really entertain red lines. I guess I'll jump in next. Um, so I was in a state that did not was not part of the national agreement, and we didn't have that in our state level. So we, I did all of the contract negotiations individually, which poses challenges, but it also led to some great conversation with our vendors. I tried really hard to not be overly strict to follow those that that standard language. And I was the one that typically produced the DPA and not the vendor providing one to us. It would be great if there were a few that provided me one that we would go back and forth on, but most of the time it was for me to provide a DPA. And some of the, um, the language that we had probably the most conversations over would be the ones, and it, sometimes it's in the contract, sometimes it was on the privacy side of it, language around COPPA and parental consent. Um, or the vendor, the vendor identifying themselves as a school official, and which that's for me to do is to identify them as a school official. But then they would say that they're acting as a school official, but we would need to get direct parental consent. And as you guys heard before, those those two contradict each other because I can consent on behalf of the parent if you're doing nothing other than providing that service for me which then allows me to be compliant with FERPA. But if you're asking me to get direct parental consent, that typically means either there's a confusion about the application of, of COPPA, or you're doing something that then will not allow me to designate you as a school official because I cannot maintain my FERPA compliance if you're doing something else with my data. And, and so that language and having those discussions were probably one of the like the most um, back and forth. That in a Missouri, our school auditor requires us to keep an inventory of all of our data and all of our systems and getting our vendors to provide us a data inventory. Sometimes their technical teams had um, some, some pushback when we would have to engage in some discussion around data inventories and being able to maintain those. So from a school and district administrative perspective, um, especially having spent my career in New York State um, and dealing with individual DPAs for any ed tech vendor we wanted to bring into the school system, um, I know that the school district administrators are really looking forward to participation in SDPC um, in New York State, as well as the uses the, of the NDPA. Um, it'll just streamline things, and um, people are anxiously awaiting for the, the final announcement that it will be available in New York um, because, it, you know, it's quite cumbersome 
as you can imagine, with working with individual DPAs for every single vendor that's brought in that has access to personally identifiable information. Um, so from that perspective, um, it's a great relief. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, so we just talked a little bit about um, uh, uh, what we look for when reviewing a data privacy agreement and kind of getting that into place. But um, uh, businesses aren't static. The needs of schools aren't static. And sometimes changes happen. So uh, I have a question that I'm going to start with Rama for, but really want uh, to open it up to Andre and Melissa after. What happens if a vendor makes a material change to its product, um, especially where behavior behavior and data collection is concerned? So currently, if a vendor is going to be collecting additional or different data elements from students, they need to contact the um, whoever the originating data privacy agreement is with. So whatever school district that might be, or they could contact my organization as well and we would help. But the, the data privacy agreement either needs to be amended to show the new data elements collected, or that DPA needs to be inactivated and a new DPA needs to be signed. That's currently the process. With NDPA version two, the SDPC resource registry is going to have an automated function so that member vendors, um, vendors that join SDPC as members, they will be able to electronically amend the data collection elements. They're in exhibit B of this DPA. So they'll be able to amend exhibit B and it will push it out not only to the originating district, but to all of the districts that have piggybacked on that DPA as well. The district um, has the ability, all districts that participate in the DPA, they have the ability to reject that amendment if they wish to do so, but it is an electronic function. Members, I'm sorry, vendors who are not members of the SDPC community can also amend with this new functionality, but it's a paper process. It's not electronic. And there are instructions for doing that. So we think amendments to the DPA for data element collection will be a lot stre more streamlined and easier for vendors and districts going forward. Yeah, I think that going back to what Melissa started with, with transparency and trust, um, that really sits here as well. You, you know, if if there's going to be changes in the data collection process, the EdTech vendor has to be upfront with the school districts about what it is, um, clearly explain the nature of the changes and the reasons behind them and how it will impact the end user. Um, and it's really key that that type of communication happens um, quickly and in advance of any changes, because it is a partnership and you want to maintain that trust with the school district. Yes, and I want to add that typically our contract, which sometimes has a sales agreement, but we have a general description of what services are being provided to us. And then we maintain direct control over the use of our data. And if a vendor adds how, like changes how they're using data, adds a additional functionality with the use of data or collects additional data points without us amending the contract, then we don't have direct control over our data. And it has to fall within that scope of what we've given permission for. And, and making sure then that if that's changed, we come back and we either have the ability to accept and continue use of service or reject, maybe we don't get the enhancement or maybe we stop the use of service, but that direct control is necessary for our FERPA compliance. And um, so that open communication and transparency. We, and we've seen this a lot lately and I know David's gonna dive into AI, but as additional functionality comes in and the different uses of data, we have to make sure before that even gets pushed out into our environment that we have those contracting terms settled. And that goes back to the audit trail as well. 
because Absolutely. we want to be able to keep those detailed records of what changes were made, the collection. Um, it all requires really careful legal consideration. And so we want to be able to maintain it from an audit perspective. Um, in New York State right now, schools are being audited um, or reviewed for compliance. And one of the big areas is the contracts and third party use of data. So that's a big thing that's happening right now. Yeah, this is all extremely useful information uh, about this, especially as uh, Melissa mentioned, uh, AI is coming into play and that's changing a lot of functionality. I know that David will talk about that a lot more. Um, we are about to uh, turn over to the Q&A portion and I'm going to give our audience members some time to, to ask their questions. And while doing so, I'm going to ask one uh, final question uh, to everyone here. Um, uh, First, what are your final thoughts uh, just overall uh, on the topic of the panel? And uh, second, what is uh, one thing that you wish vendors better understood about contracting the schools, uh, privacy, and the school's obligations under FERPA? I'll jump in. <laughs> That, that is, um, feels like a loaded question. There's, there's a lot, let's unpack that a little bit. Um, overall, it needs to be a partnership and a full understanding of, I am, yes, the vendor is providing a service to the school, but the school has certain requirements that we have to meet. And there's intellectual property and there's components that need to be in a contract with the vendor to protect their product but the data doesn't belong to the vendor, the data belongs to the school. The data, the identifiable data, that data directly linked to the student um, needs to be maintained. And that doesn't mean that the, the school has every control over the storage, the function, there's the security pieces that need to be there. It's a big picture, but understanding that it's a partnership and that there's transparency there. And what I wished when I was doing negotiations would be that those who are engaging in the contract discussions with the school understood all of the data being collected by the product and had those open lines of communication with the developers. Because I think in some companies that when there's a gap between what the developers are creating and the data they're collecting and how they're using the system and those responsible for contracts, that's when we get into those deeper discussions in the back and forth about data utilization, some of the contract language, but also that transparency. And if I am to fulfill my obligations, but also what I think ethically we're required to to our parents with that transparency and the communication around how their data is used, I need to understand how it's being used in that system, which means those engaged in the conversation around the contract you need to understand. Um, and helping me when there's a request for that data. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, student data privacy, it's not just a legal requirement. I mean, it's a fundamental ethical imperative. Um, you know, these ed tech tools must be designed with privacy and security up front and, and not as an afterthought. Um, it's very, that's why it's so important that um, the ed tech vendors are aware of what schools need to be in compliance with in terms of, of, of the legality. Um, student data is more valuable than ever. It's a, it's a hot commodity on the dark web. And, um, you know, educational or organizations have to tread carefully um, with how they bring those tools in. But it's also um, a balance in terms of the innovation, the pedagogical innovation that's happening in our schools, privacy, and then security, and how do you strike that balance? And um, that's why that partnership with ed tech vendors is so important to keep us thinking about how to meet our students' needs, how to be at the forefront of what innovation looks like, and making sure that the students have the tools they need um, to, to be successful. But it is that balance and that partnership is critical to understanding that balance and really maintaining it. I second what Melissa and Andrea have said. Um, and Melissa has a real point in that often in contract negotiations, you're negotiating with the company's attorney and the developer 
may or may not know what that attorney has agreed to. And we're seeing a real trend right now in products being um, modified so that students can share their work publicly or outside the school's domain. And it sounds like, I'm sure to the developer, a very cool feature, oh, this, this child just created this great work. Would it be great if they could share it publicly? Well, you can't do that. Under FERPA, you know, that that requires written parent consent and doesn't comply with the data privacy agreement. So I agree. It's the developers and the, the whole company need to be focused on privacy. Privacy should be number one in their forethought. Absolutely. And those are all uh, such important takeaways from this conversation as a whole. Uh, we have two uh, audience questions here. And the first is uh, from a questioner who is asking, where do we get the comprehensive contracts to cover us, which are not too expensive? Contracts are for purchase purchases direct by parents or even by schools. We would like to be totally protected. And how do we get covered in all the states where our students come from? Parents sign up for our programs online uh, or on the phone, and they can come from any part of the US or the world. I will paste this in the regular chat too, uh, so you can reference back to it. I feel like we can start with uh, with Rema and then um, move over to uh, Andrea and Melissa's thoughts. So I believe the questioner is asking about service contracts. If, if they're asking about data privacy agreements, my advice would be to join the Student Data Privacy Consortium so that you can use the National Data Privacy Agreement. Um, but I'm not quite sure that answers the question from the way he wants it answered. I, I think this is about service agreements. Do you think so, Melissa? And that's, that would be how I would interpret it. Yeah. And I would be cautious in trying to create an agreement that is a one size fits all for individual parents, the consumer and the schools, because there are different laws that govern that and the school's compliance with FERPA really dictates that our contract look a little bit different than what you may directly with the parent. And so you might consider having two buckets a contract for your general consumer and then one for schools. Um, I know that's not necessarily the ideal, but I think it helps to get you there. And as far as one that would work for all states, I can't say around the world, but I highly recommend if you take the state that is the most protective on the privacy and data compliance piece and you build your product to do that, which is privacy at mind, then that will fit across the entire United States. If you try to make it to where, well, you're in this state, so we're going to change what we do for you, but we're going to do something different over here because our laws are less strict, then that complicates um, your, your policies and your contracts. And so if we keep privacy and our ethical obligation to keep our student status safe at heart, then I think that um, having one that works regardless of the state that you're in is a little bit more manageable and, easy, um, and accomplishable, I should say. Yeah, agreed 100%. Um, if you can join SDPC, otherwise, you know, design with the most stringent policy regulations in mind. And again, design with that privacy in mind. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, the other question that we have from the chat uh, comes from a questioner who's asking for the part on products changes in a material way, uh, changing and changing the DPA, does that include things as simple as, um, say, a teacher giving a grade to a student inside the product, like the allowing the way that a teacher can do that, that kind of functionality? So if on the original DPA, student grades wasn't indicated as a data element collected, then the answer would be yes, that that DPA would need to be amended to show that they're now collecting student grades. If you're talking about the way the grade is entered, if it's a, a functionality issue, but that is indicated as a data element collected in the DPA, then you wouldn't need to amend it.
Thank you. I'm going to give uh, an extra second here for any follow-up questions or other questions from uh, from the audience. Okay, yeah, there's a follow-up to that question we were just answering. Uh, the audience member said, yes, say a teacher gives a student a score of 1 through 10 for their work. Right, so if, if that had been indicated in the original DPA in the section on data elements collected, you're good to go. But if that had not been indicated in the original DPA, it would need to be amended. Awesome, thank you so much to our panelists. This was a really insightful conversation on contracts and buyers. I really appreciate you all taking the time to come and join us today. Um, if there's any way that, uh, I see that Jim has already posted the link in the chat for the Student Data Privacy Consortium, um, and that is probably a good way to get plugged into Rama's work, but I will give an opportunity for our speakers to talk about ways that you can get plugged into what they are doing, uh, if, if there's anything for you all to share. <laughs> I'm happy to put my email contact information in the chat if anyone would like it. And I just added my LinkedIn information. Yeah. I'm happy to help anyone in any way. Absolutely, same here. Definitely. Daniel, you're muted. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us again. Um, we are now going to turn it over to David Soleil in perfect form to talk about AI in education, which will be a great segue because we were just talking about changes in products. And I think that this fits in really well. So without further ado, David, if you want to share your presentation. Uh, yes. Thank you, Daniel. Um, before I do, while I can still see the full Zoom, I'm gonna drop a resource in the webinar chat, which is, um, you know, you're you're welcome to look at because it'll be covering very similar material. Uh, but as I get my screen share set up, first of all, hello, I'm David Soleil. Um, I, as was mentioned, I'm the Director of Youth and Education Privacy at the Future Privacy Forum. Prior to this role, um, what are we seeing here? Says my screen sharing is paused. That's not what I wanted to have happen. Hold on one second. Okay. This cooperate a little bit better. Okay. And I will just do that then. Okay. Hopefully, okay. This looks correct to me. So uh prior to coming on to the at the future privacy forum, I was the director of uh, privacy at the Utah State Board of Education, which I think is going to help inform at least a little bit of my comments on the topic of artificial intelligence. So I'll say that my job uh, when I was at the State Board of Education was doing a lot of the exact same vetting that we've been talking about this entire session. Um, but, you know, for the contracts we were looking at at the state level, which I'll also note, you know, we had multiple hands involved with it. I was doing a privacy check. We had other people in the building who were doing other checks, looking for different things. Um, but we also provided a lot of guidance to school districts in the state on things they should be looking for. And as we've we've seen, there's lots of new artificial intelligence tools that are coming out and States and various different um, nonprofit and other groups are really looking to provide guidance to schools. I, I think the initial reaction was, um, at least with generative AI tools, that, hey, we should not use these. Kids are just going to use these to cheat. I, I feel like right now the reaction is much more like, well, let's figure out how to use them in ways that are are safe and ultimately educational. We don't want our students to not be informed about potentially helpful technologies that they'll be using in the future. Um, so a lot of this guidance is focusing on, you know, like I said, there's lots of different groups at the State Board of Education. We had our curriculum team. They would often look at things and they were looking for some very specific things that I was not as I was only looking for privacy. And I'd say a lot of the guidance I've seen come out so far is 
very much the same. It mentions privacy. I think pretty much everyone I've seen has mentioned it, but it typically just says, follow FERPA, make sure they're following, you know, all, all the laws that we've been mentioning in, in this meeting so far. But my concern is that, you know, FERPA is a, at this point will be turning 50 this year. And, you know, if you think of what technology was looking like 50 years ago, what school record keeping was, um, it, it can be a little unclear as to, well, how am I supposed to apply this law? You know, terms like school official, director information, things we've been talking about. How am I supposed to apply it? Um, for this new technology that seems like it can do a whole lot more and takes up data in very different ways. And so this past month in April, uh, we released some guidance for schools to add on to their existing vetting processes of things that are specific to AI, and in this case, specifically generative AI technologies that they should be aware of. So the first thing we say in this guidance, and that that is the the documentation that I, I dropped in the chat before I started. Um, the first thing it, that we tell schools is like all this stuff we've been talking about, like get it all together, you know, figure out what your local requirements are. In addition to the federal laws like FERPA, a, most states have some sort of state law that might dictate some specific things. A lot of the stuff we've been talking about, for example, in Utah, we required contracts. And uh, we we're also one of the annoying states that required that those contracts include some sort of auditing right language that we talked about in the prior um, procurement session. So we we point to these, but our, our, our goal with this document was not to tell schools how to do all app vetting. So we just say like, you know, like whatever your process is, it should cover all of these things. But we really wanted to jump into that last bullet of what is unique about this technology right now that you should be aware of um, that is maybe a little different than the ed tech that has come before. Um, and this is where, you know, I think even though this document was written with, um, with schools and districts in mind, I think it is helpful for companies to be aware of as well, because as has been clear, and I and I like, I think it was Melissa who said it in the last uh, panel. You know, it, it really needs to be like a partnership. You know, you're you're working together with a school. Um, they're going to come at you with certain questions if you're using any kind of AI technology. And I know that from my position in my old job, the first thing I would have wanted to know is like, well, what are we using this for? Um, ed tech used to be much simpler. You could say like, this is a math app. And I feel like I always use math apps as an example because I have a teenager who I constantly have to help with his math. Um, so I know that app very well. And it's pretty simple. There's, you know, a little input thing and you can put answers that look like answers to math questions in and it will have a very limited number of outputs. It will say, you know, that answer is correct or that answer is wrong and like, or, or it's partially correct, but think about it some more very limited on the inputs and outputs. And if any of you have used, say like chat GPT or Google Bard or any of these newer technologies, you know that like the number of inputs is much larger and the number of outputs is also potentially much, um, not even potentially, definitely gonna be larger than like a simple program that you use for math. So one of the first and most important things I would be asking, you know, particularly if it was a, a very general use generative AI tool, something like ChatGPT. If they just came and said, hey, can we use ChatGPT? I would come back and say, use it to do what? Off the top of my head, here's all sorts of examples I could think of. You know, some of the um, use cases might be, um, might not touch on FERPA or any of these state laws at all. You can, uh, I mean, just looking at some of these, like, it doesn't seem like it would necessarily have to um, use any sort of student PII in it, you know, they added that very specific example at the bottom of the student focus box, you know, tool that helps a student generate computer code doesn't require any kind of a login. You just type in, I want my um, Python code to do X and it shoots out Python code. Seems very unlikely um, that, you know, again, like there's metadata and other things that could be happening, but like that, that's one that probably would not touch on FERPA. Some of these, though, I think are going to be very, very obviously touching on it. Um, intelligent tutoring system. This is a lot of the ones we're seeing come out now where it's a co-pilot that is learning how the student, um, you know, their preferences, things like that, and then like helps personalize their learning based on different inputs the student gives. 
Um, these ones, you know, particularly again, there will be like a student profile, a student account. They're logging in. There's there is personal data that the student PII is being shared. And so that would be one where I'd probably say, okay, for that use case, that's definitely going to fall under FERPA, definitely going to fall under our state law. Um, but you know, that that's one of the first things I would be thinking of is well, what are we using this tool for? And I'll also note for vendors. You know, I think it's important for you to think about, particularly if, um, you know, not to jump too far ahead, but if the information is going to go into a larger um, LLM or large language model, what are potential uses that could be for? Because that's one of the, I think the real big privacy challenges is, you know, just first of all, always notifying the the customer, the school in this case, what is the data going to be used for? But knowing that there's so many potential cases, again, like the infinite number of potential outputs that you haven't even come up with yet. So that those are the kinds of things I would be looking for, particularly in a contract is like, are there, are there some sorts of limits or is this pretty limitless? Could we start getting into some of those commercial uses, things I'd need to worry about with COPPA or FERPA? Um, I would want to see, you know, either from us, the school, or from you, the company, some sort of limits being put on it to ensure that we're using it. The data is only going to be used in the educational sphere. Um, so it, let's say that it is requiring student PII. Um, you know, I, I'd want to know, like, well, is it the input? Are you putting student PII into the system? Um, or is the student potentially going to enter it? And this is where I know, because I've been to so many meetings where they say, hey, just don't enter student PII. And if you're putting it in front of a student themselves, students um, are rebels sometimes. So if you say, hey, don't ever enter your name in this, I guarantee that a student, uh, at least one student, if not more, are immediately going to type in like, hi, my name is Jeremy. Um, or they'll do it for like one of their friends or something. So like that there doesn't feel like a strong enough control. Um, I've seen some companies with their tools that, you know, it, it you know, when you log in, like, you know, it's because it's, it's conversational, um, it'll immediately say, hey, don't enter any, you know, personal information in me, but also I'm not collecting it. If, if I, you know, if my sensor indicates that you have entered your name or birth date or something like that, I'm not going to keep that information. And those would be good practices I would hope to see if, again, your intent is, to limit the amount of student PII going in. Um, I'd also want to understand, you know, what, you know, not just the inputs and outputs, but like what decisions are we going to be making with it? Because I think this is when um, a lot of parents and a lot of individuals become concerned and even some newer state laws that um, relate to AI in general. Um, you know, is, are we going to be making some really substantive decisions about a student um, the example I'm, um, we've seen in both the U.S. and also notably in Europe with the EU AI Act relates to school admissions. Um, seems, again, like that would be a great time saver where it's like, I'm going to enter all this information about all the applicants into a system, and it will come out and say, like, select these 10 people. Um, in many states right now, we're seeing proposals, or uh, in a few cases, they've already passed where, like, you at least would have to offer the option to opt out of that automated decision making. Um, in some cases, um, like in the EU, that that would call for a risk assessment at the very least. Um, so that's something I would also want to be aware of, depending on exactly what it is I am marketing, as well as um, um, you know what 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 are the potential uses and decisions that the school will be making with it? Oh. Um, ultimately, what a lot of this comes down to, and hopefully this sounds familiar based on everything that has been said before me, is, you know, I'm going to want to understand, like, the entire flow of the data. You know, what is the information you're collecting? What are you doing with it? How are you storing it? What additional uses might there be for it? How long are you going to keep the data? So I'm going to want to see if I'm the reviewer from start to finish everything that's happening. And this relates also to some of the things we talked about with FERPA. For example, we didn't touch on it a ton, but as part of that right to inspect and review records, there's also a line in there that says that schools are required to provide reasonable explanations of education records to parents. So this again comes back and starts to worry me with like any kind of substantive decision making. You know, if you're using 
generative AI or any kind of automated decision making, am I prepared as the school to explain to a parent who is upset and says, hey, this got it wrong. It didn't give my kid the correct information or you, you graded them unfairly. Am I prepared to provide a reasonable explanation as to how the decision was made? Knowing that with some of these generative AI technologies, because there's billions of data points, the developers themselves can't always explain exactly, you know, what was the data point that made the difference. Um, and then we touched on this a little also, you know, FERPA does not require um, that, that detailed list of here are all the vendors where we are sending student information to, but a lot of state laws do. And in fact, Utah, where I worked, we had one where there was quite a bit of information we had to share where it was, you know, who, who is getting this information? Why are they getting it? What are the, what is the exact data they're getting? Um, so again, these are the kinds of things I would want to get from the company. And this is incidentally, cause we've mentioned like the student data privacy consortium, quite a bit because that was one of the uh, tools that we used in Utah. That's one of the exhibits um, where, you know, in addition to agreeing to all the terms, the school would send that agreement to the vendor and request basically vendor, can you fill out like, what are all the data that your tool is going to collect? Um, and then we would share that publicly as required by our state law. I want to share with everyone and I'll drop the links in also um, when I'm done here. Um, with AI, hopefully it's clear that this can be a, a much more challenging than with some more traditional ed tech to be able to explain everything that's going on. Um, so in doing our research, we found some companies. Um, so here's Class Dojo. I just screenshotted a small part of it. Um, the actual um, transparency page they have has multiple tables here that are extremely detailed as to what is the feature that that they, they, the company have built? What is the information it needs? How are you going to use it? How long are you going to retain it? Um, I thought this is a really fantastic example that would have helped me if, you know, again, I was the one reviewing, they said, hey, you know, we're considering using Class Dojo. I would go to this, really do my best to understand exactly how the tool works. Here's another one for Zoom, um, for their AI companion feature, which, perhaps some of you have turned on during this presentation. Um, this again, explains really well, feature by feature, how does it work? What is the content it's using? What happens to that? Um, so I would expect and hope that, you know, as we see more of these AI tools coming out, that vendors that are, you know, trying to be good players in this space will have better and better examples of this, these kinds of transparency, um, and explainers and so on. Um, ultimately though, I think one of the big questions I would have is, is one that goes back to things we were talking about with COPPA and a, a little bit with FERPA, but you know, the way these tools work is there is an LLM, a large language model that um, oftentimes is built by scraping the public internet for, for um, natural language and, or, it could also be with images. All we can include those kinds of tools as well. Um, a lot of them right now, if you are, you know, went into Chat GPT and started asking it questions, the default setting is that that information is going to be used to further train the model so it can get better at what it does. Um, this is where, you know, again, we go back to contracts. I start to wonder because typically the contract would say, you know, we're we're doing something for a specific purpose explained in the contract, one that, you know, the school has a legitimate educational interest in and that you as a school official would be authorized to do. Um, so, you know, if, if it's going into that LLM, this goes back again to where it's like this technology, there's so many unthought of additional uses. You know, you might be able to use that data for things you haven't even come up with yet. And that's what makes it an exciting technology, but makes it concerning, particularly in a student context, that, you know, students K through in K through 12, or certainly even higher education, you know, you, you shouldn't be essentially scraping all this information then to create commercial products would be a, a really good example of where I think a lot of these laws would start to be concerned. But so everyone is aware, this is from guidance from the US Department of Education on FERPA compliance, 
where in the question of just overall product development, um, they have said, you know, that you can use data even in individually identifiable form to improve delivery of the applications that you're already doing. Um, Non-PII data, such as metadata or, you know, kind of de-identified ones with direct and indirect identifiers removed, could be used to create new products and services. So in most cases, I think FERPA would say, you know, if you de-identify, there's no worries. And for the exact, you know, if it if it's for the actual product that the data was entered for, you can even use PII to improve that product. What's important, because I know this group, um, we were brought together by um, by New York, is that state laws might add um, some more restrictions on this. And New York is one of those. So in New York, you are going to be required to have a contract. That contract is going to state that the data can only be used for uh, for the per uh, can, may not be used, excuse me, for any other purposes other than those explicitly authorized in the contract. So that's either going to require you to, um, you know, go back and renegotiate when it's like, hey, we have come up with another tool for schools, or we would like to be able to. I think we're going to also start having to look at maybe some like parental consent options. You know, if you if you'd want to be able to experiment in that kind of way. Um, Florida is another example if you do business there where product improvement would only be permitted with de-identified data according to that law. Um, so that th those are the things that we really discuss in our document. Um, hopefully it is helpful for you to consider knowing the kinds of things that schools really should be thinking about. But just so some takeaways in this first bullet, I think hopefully was clear by everything that's been said before me. Um, schools are going to follow a process to vet applications. You need to be prepared to demonstrate how you're going to meet those requirements. Um, in many states, they're going to send a data privacy agreement or uh, a separate contract. And I think in the case of AI, what would be good for you now would be to be thinking about how are you going to be transparent, not just for this contracting process, but also being aware that you know people are scared of new things. And even if you have a really exciting use case and tool that is meeting all the privacy requirements of, you know, individual state laws and federal law, um, you still have to convince parents and teachers that it's not scary. And I, I think particularly, you know, depending on the kind of decision making that it can do, you're going to want to be able to demonstrate that, no, like, you know, it this will be a good thing. I, I think if probably the closer parallel because it I think it's it's got a little bit more um lead time than uh, generative AI and ed tech would be you know um autonomous vehicles you know just think about like how do you feel about the notion of you know your car driving yourself seems really exciting and neat but at the same time where it's like oh there's all kinds of things where it's like I'm not in control now I'm worried I have questions I have concerns like you know will the car actually stop if you know like the the kind of ethics scenarios where it's like mm, it's going to have to swerve, and if it swerves to the right, it's going to hit a, hit this kind of person. If it swerves to the left, it might cause this kind of damage. How does the car make those decisions? Um, if, if you've looked at it at all, you know that it's like there's going to be a lot of consumer hesitancy to give all their control over completely, even if statistically speaking, it is going to make safer decisions than humans. So I imagine, you know, hopefully like your ed tech is not going to cause, you know, as much potential uh, road damage as an autonomous vehicle. But I use that as an example so you can see how, you know, it isn't just legal compliance. New things, um, particularly ones where humans are giving up power, um, there's going to be skeptics parents, students, and the schools themselves. So I think that's also why the transparency bit and the explainability bit is going to be really important beyond just privacy compliance. And with that said, I will jump into the chat to see um, what kind of questions, if any, or um, I actually think I'm passing it back to Daniel if um, there's no additional questions to be able to discuss the student privacy pledge a little bit. So Daniel, I'll pass it to you. 
Yeah, and if there's any questions on uh, David's AI presentation, go ahead and feel free to drop them in the Q&A or the chat while I'm giving my presentation and we can quickly circle around to them after I'm done. Um, so yeah, I'm going to share my screen. Can everyone uh, see the presentation? Yep, looks good. Okay, awesome. Uh, so I'm doing a quick uh, presentation on the student privacy pledge to uh, finish off uh, this, this boot camp. So uh, what is the pledge? Uh, the student privacy pledge is offered by the Future of Privacy Forum in conjunction with the Software and Information Industry Association to safeguard student privacy regarding the collection, maintenance, and use of student personal information. More specifically, the pledge is a public promise to adhere to 13 commitments related to the responsible collection and use of student data. The pledge is available to vendors who uh, are designated school service providers under FERPA's school official exception, as explained by Alexa, um, and they collect student PII and contract with public elementary and secondary schools within the United States. And uh, although we ourselves do not enforce these commitments, this pledge is enforceable by the FTC or state attorneys general. Uh, a quick overview of what the pledge is not, uh, just because I do get some frequently asked questions uh, from vendors who have started the process or inquired about the process for becoming a signatory to the pledge. Uh, first, the pledge is not a process that requires a paid subscription plan or any other monetary payment to become a signatory. I believe some badges or certifications on the market do require dues or payment to upkeep, but this is not one of them. Uh, the, sorry, the pledge is not a certification or audit. Uh, the review and signatory sign-on process does not in any way represent that a company is entirely compliant with applicable laws, nor does it certify that uh, a privacy policy is uh, wholly comprehensive. The pledge uh, commitments are only intended to concisely detail existing federal law and regulatory guidance regarding the collection and handling of student data and to encourage service providers to clearly articulate these practices. The pledge is also not a legal review of privacy practices and security controls. Uh, that is a lot more in the weeds than what we are getting into, which is looking at public facing documents to see if they are consistent with pledge principles and then allowing a vendor to sign on as a signatory once policy language is consistent. Uh, and finally, this is not a process that must be renewed annually. I know that some certifications or badges require companies to go through the same application or review process yearly to maintain an accolade or certification, but that is not the case here. Uh, this does not mean that once a company is a signatory that they should not ensure they continue to maintain the pledge commitments uh, as their company evolves or that we may not re yeah that we may not reach out to you if we observe a uh, language or or uh, something that is inconsistent with the pledge principles you signed on to. Uh, but this is to say that if you applied today in 2024, I'm not going to uh, boot you off or reach out a year from now in 2025 and ask you to reapply or uh, kick you off for failing to reapply. All right. So uh, what do we review during the application process? We review the terms of service to ensure that terms are not inconsistent with the pledge commitments or patently contradictory with applicable law. We review the privacy policy, and uh, this is generally where a bulk of the analysis and feedback takes place, and it is the main source of our review. Uh, and finally, we review other relevant policies necessary to a, a review of the pledge commitments, uh, as such as supplementary cookies policy or a COPPA's notice, or uh, as uh, some businesses have done, a child-specific privacy policy. Um, each business is different, so what policies may be relevant across various businesses and business models um, differ, but it should be noted that any policy referenced in or relevant to the privacy policy should, as a matter of practice, be linked within the privacy policy. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, the pledge commitments. Uh, like I mentioned, there's 13 of them, and I'll run through them uh, quickly enough to explain them, but also leave some time for, for David to answer some questions about AI. 
so the first is uh, only use student PII for authorized purposes. Uh, what we're getting at here is uh, for some description of use limitations within the privacy policy, especially as it relates to student PII, I understand that some services uh, collect student PII, but also PII of uh, certain adult groups, whether uh, the, the vendor offers a, a general audience application along with edtech services, or if that ed tech vendor um, also collects information from like a teacher or a parent in conjunction with their service. Um, and, and here with the use limits, it is uh, very helpful to have uh, clear language on uh, use limitations specifically for that student data, oftentimes because uh, the data collected from students will differ from the data collected from other parties. Uh, we are also looking for, uh, in the second commitment and statement that says that a vendor will not sell student PII, this is uh, also uh, prohibited by many uh, laws, uh, many state laws uh, to not sell student data. Um, so this uh, commitment would be consistent with those laws. Uh, the third commitment is no behavioral advertisements to students. And uh, same thing here, uh, many state laws already mandate that um, there is no behavioral advertising to students. Um, the fourth commitment is to not build a personal profile of a student other than for supporting authorized educational or school purposes. Uh, and for this one, uh, it was kind of uh, hinted at, I believe, during the, the uh, FERPA conversation, um, about not building or collecting more information and building uh, profiles about students. Um, we will look for some sort of statement in the privacy policy that says that you do not collect more information that is necessary for the educational purpose and that you don't keep profiles on students after the authorized educational purpose is over. And that's what this commitment really relates to. Right. To the next one. The fifth commitment here is that uh, the vendor will not make material changes to school uh, service provider education privacy policies without first providing prominent notice and choice. This one's really important, and I'm going to get, I'm going to return to this one for a little bit more explanation because it is a very important one. Um, but uh, a, a big thing to note here is the notice and choice aspect. Uh, the next uh, commitment is that the the vendor will not knowingly retain student. Uh, PII beyond the time period required to support the authorized educational or school purposes. This is hinting back to retention policies. So uh, having a statement that um, of the retention policy or that it is uh, consistent with uh, state law is um, what we're looking for when, it, when we're talking about this commitment. Um, the next, uh, the seventh commitment is clearly in contracts and privacy policies stating the types of information collected and the purpose for information. There are some, uh, uh, or state laws will require this. Um, but what we're trying to get at here is that we want to see that vendors can accurately identify uh, the personal information that they're collecting from students and why they're collecting that uh, information and that a vendor is not uh, uh, trying to claim uh, that a certain piece of data is not personal information that they can use it for purposes um, uh, beyond that the, the authorized educational purpose. Um, yeah, okay. For the next commitment, uh, the vendor will support access to and correction of student PII. So this is, this relates to uh, access rights uh, for uh, schools and where necessary parents. This is also another very important one that uh, I will discuss a little bit more uh, in, a, in a couple slides here. Along with commitment number nine, honestly, because uh, the vendor will maintain a comprehensive security program. This one is uh, very, very important for becoming a signatory to the student privacy pledge. Um, commitment 10, requiring that subcontractors follow the same commitments uh, for the given student PII as the vendor. Um, as the education technology vendor that signed on to the pledge. Uh, this one here is a, a vendor management kind, uh, kind of commitment where we're just hoping to see that uh, student PII across uh, the ecosystem within which an ed tech vendor will work uh, is going to be safeguarded with the same pledge principles as uh, the vendor itself is using. Um, go to the next slide. Uh, for the 11th commitment, uh, we uh, require that uh, six, 
We ask that uh, vendors require successor entities to maintain the student PII protections. Uh, what we're talking about here is change of control. Um, so in the event of a merger acquisition, the, the entity that comes after the one that's adopting the principles uh, will uh, maintain the, the uh, student privacy pledge commitments. And this kind of takes on a, a double-edged sword that I will talk about a little bit later, where it could be either notice and choice or uh, an agreement between the existing vendor and the successor entity to uh, continue to uh, observe the policies that the, the current vendor is observing that uh, is consistent with the pledge. Uh, for the 12th commitment, uh, that the vendor will incorporate privacy and security uh, when developing or improving our educational products, tools, and uh, services and comply with applicable laws. We aren't actually looking for uh, anything stated in the privacy policy here. It uh, is a little bit hard uh, to, to look for something that can explicitly necessarily, I guess, prove this part. Um, so uh, what we're we're looking for here is just an acknowledgement uh, from the vendor that they will do so. Uh, and then for the 13th uh, commitment, it is the same deal. It's an acknowledgement, uh, and it is that the vendor will uh, commit to providing resources to support educational institutions or agencies, teachers, parents, or students um, to protect the security and privacy of student personal information while using the educational service. Now, returning back to the ones that I flagged as uh, super important for the pledge, uh, although all the pledge commitments are important, there are some commitments that we uh, have to see some affirmative language on in the policy, and they are really critical to becoming a signatory. Uh, these four commitments are uh, provisions regarding material changes to the privacy policy and inclusion of language on notice and choice. Uh, what we need to see here is a prominent and direct notice provided to users and some sort of choice to agree to updated terms or decline consent for updated terms, uh, which could include an option to for a user to delete their account and information as a result of material changes. Um, for a prominent uh, notice, uh, something that would not be sufficient for the pledge is just uh, in your privacy policy saying, like, uh, uh, look back here at this privacy policy for the most uh, recent version to see if it's been updated. Uh, when we're talking about notice, we want uh, like either a, a pop-up that appears uh, on a user screen the next time that they log in after a change has been made to notify them, or an email to the user uh, that such change is happening. And then choice, um, it could be something like a, a checkbox where they consent to these new changes, uh, or some within that pop-up when somebody's logging in saying that like, Hey, and continuing to log in and continuing to use the service is is agreeing to these new terms. That could also be a, a, a part of choice. Um, another important uh, one that I have already hit on was provisions about change of control involving successor entities. Um, so what happens to student data in the event of a merger acquisition? For this one, um, they, uh, like I said, can uh, contract with the current vendor can contract with the successor entity to uh, have them maintain the same privacy policy as uh, the one that is consistent with the pledge or allow users notice and choice to have their data um, sent to this new entity or to have it deleted before it is transferred over to the successor entity. But um, that is something that we would need to see in, in the privacy policy in order to have someone come on as a signatory. Uh, comprehensive security program language, uh, and what we mean by this is language on how a vendor keeps student data safe beyond a statement that a vendor has a comprehensive security program and that no program is foolproof. I'm not saying don't include uh, those statements, but uh, we are looking for something a little bit deeper than uh, just those vague statements. We're looking for some description of controls that are put in place. Uh, that's a great ad. Uh, this is also uh, becoming an increasingly important requirement where security requirements under COPPA regulations are likely to uh, be increased and updated with the next within the next year, as, as Jim was explaining. Um, so really having this comprehensive security program language here to be uh, consistent with applicable law, but also consistent with the privacy commitments is, is hugely important. Um, and finally, language on access rights for the school or a parent where applicable. Um, this one is, is more straightforward, but nevertheless important, just uh, providing contact information and making sure that that is uh, an obvious uh, 
section of the policy uh, for access rights for, for schools. All right. So what is the pledge application process like? Um, I'll just give this a quick overview uh, before closing. Um, so first, a vendor would apply to the pledge through the studentprivacypledge.org website. And um, while I'm talking, maybe some, one of my colleagues could drop that link in the chat. Uh, and we will receive the application on I, our end. Uh, second, we would conduct an el eligibility review. Uh, and you generally won't hear from us at this phase. If you are eligible, um, we will just continue on to the review. And then the next time you hear from us, we'll be with uh, our feedback. Uh, so no news is good news here. But if we do need information then uh, from you, then we will uh, follow up with an eligibility email uh, requesting the specific information that we need to determine your eligibility. Third, we will assign uh, the application to a reviewer on our end who will be the one who's in, in contact with you. They will reply uh, back to the email address provided in the form within about four weeks uh, with an initial review that includes feedback. Uh, fourth, we will continue to uh, respond, respond back and forth with the applicant uh, until all areas of the application are consistent with the pledge commitments. Uh, and the review is complete. And once the review is complete, uh, we will let you know and we will add you to our, uh, our pledge page as a signatory. Um, along with this, you will also receive uh, pledge badges from us that we will send electronically and you can put on your website to show that you are a student privacy pledge signatory. Um, these badges are also uh, included on the ISTE index. Um, and we update that quarterly. So uh, whatever the next quarter is after you become a signatory, you should uh, see, your, see the pledge uh, badge next to your company's name there. Um, it seems like there are some schools that really value having the student privacy pledge. So, so that could be another plus. Um, but yeah, that's our, that's our process. Uh, if anyone has any questions about this, feel free to reach out to me um, or you can reach out to the info at studentprivacypledge.org website um, to get a little bit more information. Stop the share. All right. Um, Yeah, it looks like there is a question in the chat that I presume is for, for David and, and the AI presentation. So uh, if you're available to answer that, David. So the the question in there about um, security standards? Uh, yeah, are there any standards or norms around what qualifies as secure storage? Also, are the standard tools available for DI? de-identification? Uh, so Jim dropped in the chat um, some um, some info on both. I don't have a whole lot more to add than those, uh, but draw your attention to the chat where, um, so on the de-identification de de question, this is a resource from the uh, U.S. Department of Education on the, you know, the basics of at what point, at least as far as FERPA is concerned, you could consider data to be de-identified. So I'd refer to that. Um, you know, secure storage, um, that that's a whole other ball game, but I, I was thinking the exact same thing. So um, we were just talking about our student privacy pledge. The organization um, CISA has the K-12 education technology pledge. I would invite everyone to look at that. It doesn't, um, you know, if you look at it, it it's not answering like the st secure storage question directly, um, but more broadly, everything with within security. Um, you know, I know this was something that uh, Jim in particular, um, I think, was would look at when he was at um, his school district. And he, uh, he's mentioning some additional things in there, you know, storage buckets, which um, very common source of um, K-12 ed tech breaches um, that we see. So I, I don't know, Jim, you you answered a lot in the chat if there's more you want to say, but I, I don't have um, anything to add on top of what he has given there. I put in uh, a couple things um, and we can certainly, uh, there was a, there was a comment from, from, from Sharon Tennant to see if it, uh, pulling out things out of the chat. Um, you may have the option um, in your chat uh, where there are the three dots uh, to save that, um, and certainly we can uh, save the chat and, uh, and, and, and and provide that as well. Um, but I, I think you'll probably have the ability to save the chat.
Awesome. With no further questions, I think that's all from us. And I'll turn it back over to Alexandra. Um, well, it is that time. Thank you all so much for coming to today's event. Um, special thanks to SBF for organizing such an informative boot camp. I really learned a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to reshare some invite links to the New York EdTech Slack community in the chat. And also for more information on upcoming SPF trainings, uh, you can check out the links in the chat as well. Again, thank you so much for joining.